what made me decide to, to go for the jump was in 2010, 2011-ish, one of my uh, best friends from high school and elementary school passed away from cancer. So that was like a real sort of shock and a catalyst for me to take a look in some selfish way to take a look at my life, thinking to myself, crap, you know, who knows how long we're going to live uh, if I was going to go in the next, you know, year or two or a month or two. I didn't really want to spend the last days of my life uh, working in a, in a big corporate environment where um, while the people were great every day when I was going in, it felt like my soul was slowly dying. Uh, I just wasn't, wasn't uh, in it. And so basically then I packed my bags, started traveling, and then along the way just started uh, building businesses here and there until eventually we um, sort of doubled down on, on the current brand, Mantis Sleep. I trust that life will take me to a better place based on the action I've taken today. Trust process. So this is called a Mantis Sleep Mask and it's a eye mask that is very different than your typical eye mask that you receive on airplanes. Now, I actually get the opportunity to interview the founder of this company. His name is Mark. He actually used to live in Vancouver, but now he lives in Taiwan. And it was such an incredible interview because I asked him how he was able to come up with such an idea, how he was able to raise $700,000 on Kickstarter to prove out that there is actually demand for this product. What were some of the challenges that he had during the manufacturing process for such a new design, a brand new product, what were some of the key drivers? What were some of the things that really moved the needle for him when it comes to building a brand on his own website and why ultimately he decided to actually put his product up on Amazon as well. If you guys are interested in building your own physical product brand, make sure you listen to the entire episode. If you guys enjoy this type of content, all I ask is for you guys to smash the thumbs up button leave something down in the comment section, subscribe to the channel, and sit back and enjoy this interview with Mark Zhang, the co-founder of Manta Sleep. Hey, what's up guys, it's Tom here. Welcome back to another episode of the Tom Wang Show. And today I'm super, super excited to be interviewing Mark, who is the founder of a company called Manta Sleep. Uh, I always get super excited to actually interview the founders where I've been using their product for a long, I've been using your product for like, Probably two years now, actually. A year or two. Yeah, no, I have the new one. Tony actually gifted to me, and uh, like recently, I think in Christmas or something like that. But um, yeah, I never knew you were from Vancouver, and it seems like we have some mutual friends. So we got connected through our mutual friend Tony over at Vessi. So thank you, Tony, for that. But Mark, I'm really excited to dive into your story today, man. Thanks for uh, hopping on. For sure. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Tom Wang Show. Let's do it. So, Mark, um, why don't you just go ahead and tell us a little bit about your background before Mantis Sleep? Like you, before we're chatting, you were saying that you were an immigrant as well. You came from China to Canada at the age of eight. Tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of before uh, before Mantis Sleep. So, yeah, I mean, came over. I don't come from a family of of entrepreneurs, so you know, I was just going to school, uh, trying to get good grades. And when I graduated university, I had a job offer from an accounting firm. So I actually went and did that for about six months to a year. So got this, basically got the Asian dream going on or Asian parents dream going on. Um, and uh, what made me decide to, to go for the jump was in 2010, 2011-ish, one of my uh, best friends from high school and elementary school passed away from cancer. So that was like a real sort of shock and a catalyst for me to take a look in some selfish way to take a look at my life, thinking to myself, crap, you know, who knows how long we're going to live uh, if I was going to go in the next, you know, year or two or a month or two. I didn't really want to spend the last days of my life uh, working in a, in a big corporate environment where um, while the people were great every day when I was going in, it felt like my soul was slowly dying. Uh, just wasn't, wasn't uh, in it. And so basically then I packed my bags, started traveling, and then along the way just started uh, building businesses here and there until eventually we um, sort of doubled down on, on the current brand, Manta Sleep. Interesting. So, I mean, accounting is kind of, I would say, the opposite of your very risk adverse. At least I can say my, my mom actually teaches accounting in China, and she's like the most risk adverse person ever, ever. Um, 
so did you have any sort of entrepreneurial drive um, before your friend passed away at all? Like, were you doing side hustles and small businesses here and there at all or no? <laughs> there you go. Interesting. How much money did you make from the affiliate marketing days? I've heard some crazy stories from my friends who used to do affiliate marketing. They said they made like $100,000 a day in profit. They went to the Lambo dealership on the same day and bought a Lamborghini. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. A hundred thousand dollars a day, dude. I, I wish, I wish that was me. No, I, I made a hundred grand in total in about uh, a year, and uh, and and that that was basically. It. I mean, for college, the alternative. I was thinking about getting a job, um, working at McDonald's, so uh, or something. Yeah, it's a lot better than that. Let's put it that way. So, I, but I, I really have to say, I, was, I just got lucky. It wasn't. Uh, I think anybody with a half a brain and two cents per click on Google AdWords would have been able to make money at that time. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, 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 I met a few people here in Vancouver who are like the whales in affiliate marketing days. And they were just telling me stories of how easy it was to make money. Uh, some ways were a little bit more shadier than others, but uh, to each of their own. And I was like, man, like, what the hell was I doing? Like, how come I didn't meet you back in the day? But everything happens for a reason, I guess. So you, you packed up your bags and you went to go travel. Um, where, where did you go? So packed my bags and, uh, and I went to Singapore. Uh, chasing the digital nomad dream, uh, but I, I was thought my, thought myself as a fake digital nomad because I go to a place and I lived there for a really long time. So I was there for four years. Uh, worked at a at a company called Asus. They make computers, laptops. But during that time, I was also experimenting with entrepreneurship, and I started doing that during that time because I didn't have anybody in my life that was really in business per se. But I was listening to a podcast called. Uh, Mixergy by Andrew Warner, old school podcast, been around for a long time. And he basically goes like you and interviews a bunch of entrepreneurs, get their story, see how they did their thing, succeeded, and so on. And as, as I was listening through a period of three to six months, I just started to realize that these people aren't so different from me. I always had this mental block in my mind. I was like, well, I don't know anything about business. I don't want to take risk. I'm super risk averse. Um, and so as I was listening, I was like, man, these people sound like they're just the same as me, if not dumber. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, knocking on anybody here, but they, they, some of them sounded like just like average Joe's just like myself. Right? Give, it, so give, it, could do give it, give it, give us some names. Who was the dumbest person you ever heard on a podcast? You're like, <laughs> you're like, man, I this guy, the dumbest this person guy. I've heard on a podcast is Mark Zhang. That's, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> hey remember, guys. And I, yeah. At the end of this podcast, I hope the one thing you take away from this is if Mark can do it, anybody can do you it. You can do so, it. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> honestly. That, that, that was, I mean, I remember, I don't, this was so many years ago, but I remember listening to one podcast on Mixergy and Andrew was asking the guy like, so like, so do you know your margins? And he's like, I've got no idea. Somebody else is on the team has got this. And I was thinking to myself, and maybe this is because of the accounting background. I was thinking to myself, how can that be the case? How can you not know how much money you're making? But anyway, during that time, it sort of made me think like, hey, man, maybe I could do this myself. And then so that sort of kickstarted the whole journey, entrepreneur journey once again. Right. No, that's super interesting. I, I, can, I can totally relate to that because I listened to one called uh, How I Start, How I Built This uh, mm. by uh, a guy, a guy Raz. And he interviews a lot of these founders. A lot of them are like super big companies. But one thing that that I that I get from every single episode is exactly what you mentioned. It's like, these people are no different than you and I, except they right. went through the struggles. They, they, they paid right. their dues. Uh, right. They face adversity, but they overcame it. And that's honestly right. the biggest lesson I've learned from a lot of these entrepreneurs um, is that they're really not no one special. Um, but right. so I have to ask, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, I guess you're now your entrepreneurial journey. You said you started a few businesses. What was like the first business, second business? What were some of the businesses you started before Mantamask? So I did something called a slip stopper. Uh, and uh, a lot of my Vancouver buddies are just, they still remember that nightmare. But basically it was a, it was a little skin you put on the back of your phone and prevent it from sl slipping. And I did a Kickstarter campaign, raised $5,000. And I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. So I did that for a while. And then uh, that kind of, didn't have any strategy like you said so like the, before the call you were mentioning about like having no clue what the hell you're supposed to do i knew cl no clue what the hell i was supposed to do the only acquisition strategy i had was to send out samples and get it featured in different mm -hmm. publications which actually worked it was number one on the forbes 
best uh, phone case list for a while, which drove a lot of sales, but I didn't know how to do anything else. So when that fizzled out, it was, it was not getting enough sales to make enough money for me to live off of. So I did that for like two years before I partnered up with somebody that I, this German dude that I met up uh, in Singapore, who is now my business partner for Mantis Sleep as well. And we did another business called uh, Pergo, which is a bamboo charcoal air purifier. Um, and that business is primarily driven by Amazon, still around today. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been good. And then after that, we, we started on Mantis Sleep. Interesting. So you did a Kickstarter approach for your first cell phone case company. You did a for bunch of PR. Them, actually. <laughs> for all of them, for even, all, for the, all, even, all for the, even for the bamboo? Yeah, so the, so the first Kickstarter campaign we raised five grand. And then for uh, the charcoal, we did about 40,000. And then for Manta Sleep, it was about 700,000. So uh, I'm pretty happy with the, with the trajectory progression there. Interesting. So how do you look at Kickstarter as, do you, how do you view Kickstarter? Do you view Kickstarter as more of a product market fit? Uh, if I can raise enough money on Kickstarter, then that's a good uh, a good sign that I can scale this everywhere else? Or how do you look at Kickstarter? Uh, for the first two businesses, it was, like you said, product market fit. And also we needed the cash. Uh, we would not have been able to launch without it. But for Mantis Sleep at that time, we already had a successful Amazon business as a result of Pergo and a bunch of other products we were doing. So um, the cash wasn't, I, I wouldn't say it wasn't needed, but it was like we, we could have gone by if we really stretched. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was really two things like proof of concept, like you said. And the other thing was for the publicity, right? It's really nice to be able to say we've got the most funded sleep mask on Kickstarter. Uh, it's a very public figure. So you can sort of, um, you can brag without bragging, right? Because mm -hmm. it's there, it's public, people can see it. And so that, that really gave us a lot of positive PR at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I, I always thought Kickstarter, in order to do well on Kickstarter, you have to have some sort of a unique angle. You have to have some sort of a newer product to introduce to the marketplace. I can't just yes. like put this blender bottle on uh, Kickstarter, right? Because not I anymore. Mean, it, right. It's a commodity. <laughs> but 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 for your, I, I'm curious about your charcoal bags because it's funny because that's it's one of the, it was one of my products on Amazon as well. Um, right. And I'm not sure if you know, like the number one selling charcoal bag that company went away. Do you know which Mosa, one I'm talking? Do you natural? know which one I'm talking about? Is it Moso Natural? Uh, I forget their name, but they were like they owned the page one with so many different charcoal bags, and then they really? just disappeared because uh, they 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 ran into some legal troubles with Amazon on the back end. Oh, they were damn. doing about. It, it I think there was Natural. I'm I'm pretty sure they're the largest player for many years. Yeah. I think they were yeah. doing about 10 to $20 million in revenue per year. And then they, Amazon shut them down like that. And then they couldn't, uh, couldn't back it back up. Jesus but Christ. What, but what was, what was different about, what was different about your charcoal bags that you did $50,000 on Kickstarter? Um, we, first of all, it had a novel design. I mean, like, so when I was looking at this stuff before getting into it, I always thought like, it's how, how hard is it to design a charcoal bag, right? Turns out it's more complicated than we, we did this little design that you can put in the back of your car. So it kind of integrates with the back of your car seat. At the time, everybody else is just selling bags of charcoal that you threw in the car. So mm -hmm. we had this little nice design, uh, some bright colors, um, ways to fit it together. So it looked nice and rounded. That was the, that was the differentiation. The charcoal itself is all the same, as you know. Interesting. So, oh, wow. Yeah. And very, very interesting. That's cool. Uh, when did you, when did you launch that on Amazon? 2000, I want to say 2015, 2016. Okay. So that's like the golden era. So you can still buy reviews. You can buy like a thousand reviews if you wanted to. Right. We didn't buy reviews. We traded products, free products for reviews. Cause I yes, buying reviews yes. at that and it's still also against TOS. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. What right. was not against TOS as, as was, uh, giving freebies in exchange for reviews. Obviously we can't do that anymore at all. Right. Right. Wow. That's super interesting. Okay. So you did the Mantis sleep. Um, how talk to us about how did you came up with the idea? I want to say you were on an air. I, I have no idea what the origin story is, but I want to say it's like <laughs> you on an airplane one time and then they give you this really little sleep mask and then you were and trying to like, fall asleep and all the light. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> there must be a better uh, way. <laughs> there must be a, uh, yeah. it was a little bit like that, not on an airplane. So I've been, so first of all, um, the Amazon business was doing good. Pergo was just one of the products at that point. Then we started just launching a whole bunch of different things uh, to take advantage of the golden age, golden era. Uh, but one day uh, 
we woke up not, not together. I was, we just, one yeah. day we sat, I sat down together with my business partner and, uh, and uh, we, we just realized something, which is we were just getting bored out of our minds, launching random uh, private label products on Amazon. Like we had to do the, we have to do another rolling pin for the sake of increasing the revenue and profit of the business. We we're going to kill ourselves. So just, it was just getting so boring. And so then at that point where we had some luxury with a bit of a, a runway in terms of the money that we built up, we were thinking to ourselves, like, what is the thing that we should do next? That's actually interesting. Like, what can we do that actually is going to be the legacy business that makes a legitimate impact that, that so we can go out and design something new, novel, interesting. That's never existed. Cause he's an industrial designer, right? So this is mm. very important for him as well. And I've been using sleep masks since I was 15 years old. So uh, this is something I'm a light sleeper. Can't really sleep without it. And so, then I was like, ah, we can probably do something better. And so uh, that's why we decided to do it. If you were, to, if I were to look at, at, it, at it from a business opportunity perspective, I was just doing product research. I would have never gone into sleep masks if it wasn't um, because we wanted to, to really put everything we had behind this and, and, and go for the long-term win. Because if you take a look at Amazon, you take a look at the competitive uh, landscape, super com competitive, lots and lots of different models all relatively low price, tons of reviews on Amazon. And so if you were, if we were just looking at it from a purely that perspective would have never done it, but yeah. Yeah. So you are more focused on solving one of your own pain points rather than looking at jungle scout and seeing what has low reviews and good opportunities. For sure. I mean, that's what we did for the Amazon business, but, uh, for, for Mantis sleep is because if you look at the data, like, Oh my God, there's no way I'm going to enter this market. It's, it's insane. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So your uh, partner is an industrial designer. So that obviously helps when it comes to designing the product and so on and so forth. But yes. what were some of the early challenges that you had when it comes to the product design, the manufacturing phase? Was it hard to find manufacturers that can give you good quality samples? Talk to us a little bit about that process. Um, I can bring out my, my journal. There's probably you know, 10,000 pages of all the problems that we have. Wow, um, man, where do we where do we even start? It's the, you know the most surprising thing to me, and if I didn't do this, and you and you know we were interviewing somebody else who 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 launched a sleep mask business, I would think to myself, you know, how difficult would it be to make a goddamn sleep mask? It's a sleep mask, that's not an Apple iPhone, but uh, the amount of time it took for us to figure it out was surprising. Let's just put it that way. How long uh, did it take? How long? How long was the process? took us like two years to really get the oh, first wow. the product right. Uh, wow. but I, I would also say if we had more experience, it probably would have taken a lot and more money and it would have probably taken longer. But mm -hmm. there was just a lot of experiment, experiment, experimenting with how to do this experimental phase. And because this was like one of the first uh, products that we were trying to really design ourselves and innovate on, process was completely different from just going to a factory, making tweaks to an existing product when you're doing private label, right? It's it's a totally different process. For that one, you you would go to the factory, they would make the product. You're like, okay, I want this a little taller, it's a little wider. Mm -hmm. Boom, relatively easy change. You get it done in three months, you're good to go. But with this mm -hmm. kind of stuff, when you bring to the factory, the manufacturing to, to create, um, it, it's, it doesn't work very well. Ideally, you want to build a prototype and you bring it to the factory and then they just replicate it. But we could not build the prototype because we didn't have the tooling or the resources mm -hmm. to do so. So we had to work with the manufacturer. So that process was, there's a lot of friction and it took us a long time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And the manufacturer is located in Asia? China, yes. Got it. Did you have to go physically to China? At that point, we're just like, I'm so sick of this. Let me just go to China and figure this out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, at that time, I was already in Taiwan, so it was a relatively okay. short trip. Um, but uh, even before then, when we were doing Perga, we, we always had to go to China. It always makes things easier. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, I'm curious to know how, once you find, once you got the final product, actually, let me, let me backtrack. So you put the product on Kickstarter, but in order for you to put the product on Kickstarter, you had to have at least a prototype, correct? But having a prototype and then translating that into ma uh, mask manufacturing also is a additional step. It's not necessarily because we had a prototype, everything else is going to be all good to go. Right, right. Makes sense. Um, I'm curious to know, how did you protect yourself from uh, knockoffs 
Chinese manufacturers, especially for such a no novel product. Um, and once you, you know, start selling well, worst gets around and so on and so forth. Uh, I, so we got lucky. So first of all, there are a lot of knockoffs, uh, all terrible quality, but there are a lot of knockoffs. But what I got lucky was in, in my network at the time, somebody in a forum made a post and the, I still remember what it's called. It's, it's called trademark your shit. <laughs> and then uh, I read it and it really spoke to me. Uh, also helps that my girlfriend at the time and now wife is uh, working in the legal industry. So uh, it really drove home. So we basically um, just trademark, design patent, utility patent in all the major markets, China, US, Europe. And so that has really helped. Now there are still copycats for sure, but that's really helped in terms of um, serving as a deterrent and in worst case scenarios, an enforcement mechanism to, to, to get rid of the copycats. So right. uh, it, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, especially for um, newer entrepreneurs. Cause at that time we already had a little bit of money from the Amazon business. So we were more comfortable, but before then, if you were to ask me, should, should I spend $10,000 on a utility patent? I'd be like, well, I don't even know whether how big this product is going to be. Why don't we, Put the product out, see how it does, and if it does well, then off. But then at that time, often it's too late. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem that you have to decide for yourself. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it, it, it's fascinating. I, I I didn't know that uh, Mantis Sleep was actually uh, born out of Kickstarter. So I, 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 that's really interesting. And I guess once you raise the seven, let's talk about Kickstarter a little bit. So you have this idea. Okay. I know I talked to Tony quite a bit about Kickstarter. He's like, you got to get the video right. You got to get that page right. right. And then it's a matter right. of like driving some traffic and so on and so forth. Can you talk to us about uh, Kickstarter? What are some of the, uh, the most important aspects of Kickstarter essentially? Right. So uh, I think Tony from Vessi, uh, probably uh, knows a lot more than I do because he's done a lot more Kickstarters. But I, I think mm -hmm. what you just described is, is pretty much the gist of it. I think the, the, the most important first part is to find a product that tends to work well with the Kickstarter audience. So if you were mm -hmm. doing like B2B, if you're doing like a, I know people in the past mm -hmm. have tried to do a, just through network, network, my network, some like sustainability products that's more meant for the corporate side of B2B, like these things never do well, right? So there's, it's almost like, it's not really a science, but it's like a, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of data that you can get as well as intuitively looking at what's like, for example, keychains, uh, wallets for, I don't know if it's still the case, but for a long time, these projects tended to do really well. Backpacks, because they have a broad market appeal and pretty much everybody needs one. And if you make some something interesting, innovative, they tend to capture people's attention a lot more than something like a um, nonprofit, which is important, well, but it just doesn't have the same sort of broad appeal. That's why some some of the most, pretty much all of the most raised projects on Kickstarter are actually physical products, right? They're not the other creative things, uh, uh, areas or, or categories. Uh, and the second thing is just to figure out how to drive traffic, whether you want to do Facebook ads, PR, your friend group, email list, whatever the case might be, you got to drive traffic to it. And if you do that well enough, you, it becomes a sort of like a halo effect where mm. because you're getting a lot of traffic into it, Kickstarter ranks it high. And in the end, the ideal situation, you want to end up doing about 50% um, percent sales coming from the Kickstarter itself and then 50 from external traffic being driven in. Interesting. Very cool. Um, once you finish the Kickstarter campaign, you raise $700,000, which is a Four, massive amount 50, of 400, 400 or 450 on Kickstarter, but then we took his Indiegogo later on and then made up the rest. Got it. So, uh, how, how did you feel about that number? Was that like, like we're onto something like this is, this is it. Like you felt very comfortable with that number. Yeah. 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 I mean, we, I was not expecting it to be, I, I was thinking if we do a hundred or 200 grand, we would go ahead with the business. Uh, so that was beyond my stream. Um, I think it was, you know, it, 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 things clear in retrospect and we can guess, but you never really know. It could be a luck thing. It could just be a timing thing. It could be the fact that our masks, they, a lot of customers look, say they look like mini bras because it's got the little cups and the holes in the center. <laughs> and maybe that was just weird looking enough so that our ads worked really well on Facebook and kind of made it all happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah. once you raise the money, now it's about fulfillment. Uh, now it's about actually shipping all the orders out to your customers. Uh, did you have a lot of issues fulfilling that many units or? 
Uh, no, because uh, we had done this uh, for a while. And we also, I don't usually respond to cold pitches, but when we were done with our Kickstarter campaign, a fulfillment center in Georgia pitch, reached out to a cold pitch. Seemed like all a guy. Uh, took the lead. They did a f fantastic job. We're still using them today. And our oh, volume wow. is like 10x of what it was for that back then. So that was just, yeah, it was luck there as well. Right, right. No, that's... I'm sure you can find lots of uh, lots of capable fulfillment partners to be able to get it delivered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So once you, I guess, once you um, raise about hundred thousand dollars and you uh, uh, start fulfilling all the orders and so on and so forth. So the natural next step, I guess, would be to continue the brand on Shopify uh, and start selling through Shopify. Now that Kickstarter into GoGo is done. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what the next steps were after Kickstarter. Did you guys go on Shopify right away with your Amazon experience? Did you say, let's put it on Amazon? How did Amazon fit into total, the, the overall strategy? Amazon did not fit into the overall strategy. I didn't want to be relying on it, uh, as you mm -hmm. know. Uh, we did, we for, for the current business, we, uh, we had an account suspended, not through any fault of our own in Europe. And so... That was a painful lesson because that represented hundreds of thousands of dollars in potential revenue. Um, and it was just a stressful thing, right? Like you, you had an Amazon business, so you know this. Every day, you know, you get a message from Amazon support. It's like, oh, this is suspended for no reason. This is not working for no reason. You contact the support. They're basically useless. And you go in this infinite death loop that, that never ends. And it was a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety because mm. we felt like we had we didn't really have any, if we had like 20 different Amazon accounts, we were treating it as, you know, sort of like a, that would be different, but we have one thing, our livelihoods and our team's livelihoods were dependent on it. And some random thing happens in Amazon. It just felt like we had no control. There's a lot of stress. And so, plus you don't get the customer relationship. You can't do email marketing. You can't build mm -hmm. the relationship over time, which is critical if we wanted to, you know, work on this in the long term. So, um, no Amazon at all. We just went straight for Shopify and worked on that. It's not, not, I think we only entered Amazon in 2020 or late 2019 as a channel strategy rather than using Amazon as any, any ways to kind of um, launch the business. Interesting. I, I'm yeah, curious so to know, to I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know, I mean, you know, people talk about Amazon being this channel where, I mean, everything you said was just, you know, you hit the nail on the head, like you you lose sleep in the evening. Um, and whenever you get an email from Amazon seller support, you're like, oh fuck, like, what is this? Like, yeah. is this the yeah. end of my business? It's terrible, uh, it's terrible. It, it, so talk to me, now that you know the Shopify side, I've also heard stories about Facebook ad getting suspended and this and that. What are some of the, the, the bad things about Shopify side? Um, right. So, so I don't think shop, uh, I mean, unless you're doing something real sketchy, I don't think Shopify itself is going to suspend you, but there's definitely the risk of having your Facebook ad account suspended or your Google AdWords. And a lot of our traffic comes from there. And so mm -hmm. that would also be a bad situation, but you tend to have more control over it because you're spending money on it. Right. So, so you're, as long as you're not doing anything shady and as long as you're generally following the rules it's nowhere near bad as that as amazon mm. amazon just really treat I, I don't i don't know how it is now I, I know the team still run into issues with amazon but i really think they just treat the sellers like crap mm. whereas facebook and google you're sort of the customer if anything because you're spending mm. a ton of money with them uh but you're right there's still a risk but at the at some point right it's it's I don't think any business can really diversify out of these big platforms. Our, our livelihoods are really just dependent on them, but at least now there's shop, there's Shopify, there's Facebook, there's Google, there's also Amazon. And so the, the risk is much more spread between these platforms rather than being concentrated on Amazon. Right. No, totally. That totally makes sense. Um, I want to ask you your product is, you know, when I was saying talk to Tony, because I'm thinking about starting a direct-to-consumer brand as well. One of the one of the things right. that he advised me on doing is sell a product where your AOV is at least like a hundred, hundred and twenty dollars. Like Vessi is like, right. you know, a little bit higher. You're selling a pair of shoes for a hundred bucks, and someone buys two pairs. So, but your product is not very expensive. I mean, it's expensive for an eye mask. It's definitely on the top end of an eye mask. So I want to ask, like, how are you able to make such an inexpensive product to work? Uh, uh, on Shopify, you have to pay Facebook ad money. You have to pay Google ads money. What are some of the strategies that you, you, you use? Unless your margins are just like, 
you, you it costs you 20 cents to make those masks. Oh, I wish it cost 20 cents. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd, be living, I'd be going to the moon if it costs yeah. 20 cents. Like, it's quite, quite, because of the quality of the product, it's actually quite expensive. But I would say, right. so I had this question come up before where people are like, uh, like friends of mine who are also doing big business are like, how are you making this work? It's just like your AOV is pretty low. Um, mm-hmm. That is the case. So one of the, you know, one of the greatest challenges for us going forward that we've been working on the last couple of years with the new products coming out is to actually work on the AOV because if we're if if we can get it to like sixty to seventy bucks, that's going to change. Just that's going to, I mean, the, just the growth trajectory is going to be night and day compared mm. to what we have been experiencing. Um, I think we made it work again. Uh, retrospect twenty twenty hindsight is because of the weirdness of the product and how novel it was. And so we're mm. just able to get a lot of uh, response when we're doing it. If we, if we launched a water bottle that was $20, I think we're, it's going to be real challenging to try to differentiate it. But we launched something that was so new and novel in the sleep mask space that we got a lot of initial conversions. And as people came and started on the back end with upsells and cross sales and the email funnel and so that sort of carried us through um but because if at the at the at the way we're spending right now if all we had was one mask that you're right it would not be sustainable we would we would be losing our shirts mm-hmm. I, i'm curious to know um who who wh- what's your like top customer avatar who's buying your product have you identified kind of one group segment uh if you're able to share that with us yeah the um it's more like uh, psychographic rather than demographic, like as in uh, the the common thread that ties everybody together is they're a light sleeper. So mm. this could be we can get into more subset of the customers. For example, frequent travelers when COVID wasn't a thing. Uh, mm. You know, night shift uh, workers who have to sleep during the day. People who have sleep issues like insomnia. People who are just generally wanting to improve the quality of their sleep. But what's clear to us is that we don't. Our target audience is not somebody who can fall asleep anytime, anywhere, wake up refreshed. And you know those people, right? Maybe you're one of them. You have friends who are like that. Uh, but people who are light sleepers aware how important their sleep impact is on their life, uh, these tend to be the, that, that tends to be a common thread. Right. No, that makes sense. And that's definitely me. It's, um, you probably can't see my room right now, but I have uh, these windows yeah. and the blinds and they're not, they're super bright. Um I'm actually finally getting blackout blinds installed in my place oh, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I Yo. don't even have, and, and in Vancouver, you, you know yourself, like summertime, 930 is still bright out. So yeah. your whole circadian <laughs> yeah. rhythm is off the yeah. It's like 930, yeah. oh, yeah. it's like 430 and I can't go to sleep till like one o'clock. You got to get some uh, dark out curtains, man. That's going to, that combined with a sleep mask, that's, that's the, that's, yeah, yeah, you're good. Yeah. And and recently I started taking uh this uh, I'm you heard of CBD like cannabis yes uh, CBD yes, but yes. there's actually a well I actually take something called CBN uh which is something that not a lot of people yeah which is not something a lot of people don't know about if you actually go to a dispensary in Vancouver like I went to yep. probably five of them only one of them yep. knew what it was every single one of them I went in I'm like do you guys sell CBN they're like you mean CBD no I'm like CBN they're like I have no idea what that is so it's really interesting. But it's in, from the same plant as, uh, as as cannabis, but it's just a different cannabinoid, and uh, it's used for like sleeping. Uh, you can get sedated, uh, and I've been doing droppers, and it, it's it it definitely helps. I can definitely definitely notice a difference, but I would like not to rely on any sort of supplements to uh, go to sleep. Got it. Um, you, because that's I think it's interesting because I I've I've tried CBD oil before, and it, they also say it's supposed to help you sleep. Um, I don't think it made any difference in the way that I sleep. I, I was not able to notice anything. So yeah, yeah, um, same. That C C C D N sounds interesting. Or yeah, yeah. I looked it up on Google Trends and like it just never caught wave. Like it just never. There was never enough. Um, I I heard about it literally two years ago, but it's it just never caught wave, which is quite interesting. Um, what, I I want to you ask you with your sleep. Oh, falling sorry, asleep. Sorry. Falling asleep. Falling asleep. Okay. Yeah, lately falling asleep, but I think I know why because I go on my <laughs> I go on my phone like before I go to sleep, and I just yeah I I I think I know the reason why. Um, okay. But let, let's just put it that way. It's not bad enough okay. where I have to put my phone away. But I, I want to okay. ask you about your Facebook ads. So it seems like a lot of 
um, you, you spend a lot of money on Facebook ads and you said Google ads as well. But with Facebook ads, you need really good creatives. Um, yes. Can you talk to us about how do you scale creatives at a larger, uh, like how do you produce a lot of creatives? Do you do that in-house? Do you have an agency that you send to? Um, yeah, talk to us a little bit about that, what you found. Uh, yeah, now you're, you're absolutely right. The, the future of Facebook ads is gonna, you're gonna live and die by the creatives that you have because they're making everything more automated. Um, well, I always 14.5 is a different story, but uh, the, the, the creative side, we started off initially just getting photographers and videographers come in to take a bunch of stuff and then try to recycle that with graphic designers, and try to stretch it out. But now in team, we have a, a locally, we have a videographer, we have a graphic designer who's also responsible for taking photos and we're actually hiring more. We're gonna get another videographer. Um, so they are, they're eighty percent of what they do is 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 creating ads for Google and Facebook, twenty percent for like product videos and stuff like that. But it's to, to spend at scale, you really need to have a in house creative team because agencies you know, like worst case scenario, we can pass our account to an agency, but agencies are only really good at managing the account. They're not fantastic at creating generating creatives as a general rule of thumb. They're not going to be as good or passionate as you are in-house in terms of getting those things done uh, to really you know, speak your brand message. And so like they, they, they just take generic you know, templates and stuff like that. So yeah, to spend at scale, you gotta definitely build an in-house creative team in my opinion, mm -hmm, especially mm -hmm. with the way Facebook is going. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, and I think my last question to you is, you know, what does the next five year look like for you? Um, are you guys planning to exit the brand? Are you guys just going to keep this baby for a while? Are you going to start a new brand? Now you have the team underneath. What, what's, what's something that you're thinking about? I don't think we want to do anything else other than mental sleep. There's still a lot of room to grow. And uh, I, don't think, uh, I don't think we're really going to be looking at anything else for the next five to 10 years. It's going to be all, all behind mantis sleep until we're like wow. 20 or $30 million in sales or something like that. Um, but because we're there's still a lot of ideas that we have uh, that we want to bring to the world, and um, I think one of the things that's uh, that's that's uh, that often entrepreneurs regret is because so much of our self and our ego and who we are is tied into the business. Uh, you've sold a business. I've 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 heard people in my network selling businesses, and when it's sold from a place where they're like, oh, I'm so tired of doing this. They almost always regret it afterwards because um, the, the question is then what do you do next, right? And so when we were designing this business, the, the, the goal from the beginning ideally was to do it in a way where we structure the team, the growth trajectory so that we're constantly having the best time we can. And look, it's not rainbows and sunshine every day working, mm -hmm. right? But the idea is to, to not burn ourselves out so we can focus our passion on something that's gonna you know, that we can really focus on for the, for the next five to 10 years of our lives. Mm -hmm. And is it fair so to no, say, no sell anytime soon. got it, got it. Is, is it fair to say, um, you guys are expanding your product lines and product offering in the sleep niche? Um, yes. it could be, it sleep could be supplements, accessories. sleeping accessories. Got it. Um, there's yes. one company that I came across, they're called like nine, they're like a mattress company, like nine. Yes. Or, yeah. You know who I'm talking about? There's a lot of mattress companies. Uh, yeah, no, they're yeah, called like I nine something. The... Start with nine, nine. Yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, they're, that's interesting. So what other sleep accessories are there though? There's like sleep, I guess my girlfriend wears earplugs, ear there's pillows, uh, blankets. Yeah, there's, a, like there's, the, there's quite a bit. Like we're not, we're not gonna go into the mattress space, right? Cause that's like a totally <laughs> business. Uh, yeah. Sleep masks, there's a lot you can do with it, right? Like on our, on our website right now, this, you can do uh, aromatherapy, cooling, cold, oh, cool. silk, you can do Bluetooth speakers and stuff like that. We're also designing this experience around uh, what we call the pro nap movement, which is empowering people to naps. Um, I believe it's impossible to unlock your full potential if you're not getting an afternoon nap every single day. And that's like, we have these beliefs written out in our website. So it's about designing around that better ear plugs, for example, uh, nap pillows that actually work. So if you're going to the office, you can take a nap comfortably by you know leaning on your desk. There's a lot of things you can do to optimize the sleep and napping experience without getting into the more traditional areas, like necessarily creating pillows and blankets and mattresses and stuff like that. 
Yeah, totally. And are you going to put those on Kickstarter as well or? No, <laughs> it's too much work for, and, and uh, too much work and not really, we're, we're at a different stage in the business now. So uh, it's not, yeah. Right. Fair not enough. I guess fit. you have email lists and you can just like yeah. uh, contact your customers yeah. now. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Oh, super cool. Um, no, I, I, Hey, look, I really appreciate your time. Uh, guys go check out their product. I actually, um, mentioned, uh, your product to my students. Uh, I, I also have an Amazon FBA course. Maybe you sell nice. Maybe you saw a sales spike the other day. Probably not, but a few of them bought, a few of them bought the product. I might, I might, I might ask That's you for awesome. a little, I might ask you for a little, uh, affiliate code and I can be a influencer for, sure. for your brand. I appreciate all the kind <laughs> words and, and the support. And, uh, thanks for your time as well. This was fun. Yeah. Thank you so much guys. Go check out Manta mask. Uh, and, uh, yeah, if you're a light sleeper or you just want to check out the product, I think there's a lot you can learn from their product when it comes to their packaging, their on their unboxing experience, and just the product itself is honestly phenomenal. Um, and the cool thing about your product is that I don't know about others, but I tend to lose them. Uh, I, I tend to lose my sleep masks once every six months to a year. So I guess my, the LTV is, uh, is, 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 is that's good for the LTV. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, w I wish people lose them more. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, Mark. I really appreciate your time. And guys, if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button, leave something down below and I'll see you guys in the next episode.